Okay, so everyone, welcome to this evening's event on uh, Russian politics and the Sochi Olympics. Before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that we are being filmed. Um, this will go on the Harriman website when they uh, get the, um, uh, the, the video feed uh, finished in a couple of weeks, uh, probably. And so just do keep in mind that everything tonight is on the record. Um, and when people ask questions at the end, we'd also appreciate it if you would give us your name and your affiliation so that we have a sense of where you're coming from, what your perspective is when you're, when you're asking the questions. Well, it's my, my great pleasure um, to introduce what is the opening event for a mini-series that we are going to be having on the Sochi Olympics and Russian sport. Um, there is one more event that's currently scheduled that will be on November 6th um, from 5 to 7 in the evening in the James Room and Barnard Hall on the Barnard campus. And that's going to be on LGBT activism and the Sochi Olympics. And the confirmed speakers for that include Masha Gessen, who um, you may have read her op-ed recently where she talked about um, her perspectives on the issue. Jane Buchanan from Human Rights Watch, who has been following the issue very closely. And our own Tanya Domi, who teaches classes at Harriman on human rights questions. She had a series last year on um, LGBT issues in the former Soviet space, and now she's at NYU. But those three will be coming together on November 6th in the evening. We're also hoping to arrange um, a talk by two uh, former uh, Soviet Olympics coaches who coached um, uh, figure skating for the Soviet Olympics team. And so that's not um, definite yet, but we think we have an indication of interest from them. Um, and so that's another thing to watch out for. So anyway, obviously this is uh, um, uh, an upcoming event that has a lot of value in the news. And what we're going to try to do this evening is get you beyond the headlines, get you beyond the news coverage, um, and have some um, scholars who have been working on this issue in a very deep sense share their perspectives with you. And they come from very different perspectives. And so I think that we'll probably get some uh, uh, discussion and debate going here tonight. Um, but each of the four people who are speaking either have already written or are in the process of writing um, uh, either a book or a significant article um, on the, uh, the Sochi Olympics. So I'm going to introduce each of them in turn, because otherwise you might forget who they are and all of their wonderful accomplishments. Um, to start us off, we're going to have um, Andrei Makarichev, who is a professor at the Institute of Government and Politics at the University of Tartu in Estonia. He has degrees from the European Institute for Advanced International Studies and Nizhny Novgorod State University in Russia. He served in a wide variety of academic positions, um, including at the Freie Universität Berlin, in Zurich, Copenhagen, Krakow, as well as Sweden and several places in the United States. And he got his start as a professor of political science in the Public Service Academy in Nizhny Novgorod. His work has been supported by grants and fellowships from the Central European University in Budapest, from IREX, from the MacArthur Foundation, um, from the Open Society Foundations, from the NATO Democratic Institutions Fellowship Program. And he's written or edited several books, many articles, um, many focusing on European identity um, and on Russian protest movements and what that means for Russian society. So, Andre. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, I would uh, start uh, this, uh, this panel uh, with a wider uh, picture of, uh, 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 of um, sports as an identity-making uh, identity milieu. I'm interested basically in the way how different sports are related to, uh, to the key issues of uh, nationalism, sovereignty, how they change our perceptions of uh, uh, national or uh, transnational identities. And I think the social, I cannot promise that I would focus only on Sochi, because there are so many interesting cases uh, as soon as we speak about uh, sports and uh, different articulations or different perceptions of identity. Uh, but I will definitely refer to the, uh, to the Sochi case, to the Sochi project, um, specifically in, uh, uh, in my presentation. Uh, so, of course, we all know, and there is a uh, quite substantial literature, academic literature, um, um, kind of proving the fact that sports have a huge potential for promoting different types of uh, identity, uh, both national identities or transnational or cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitan type of identity. For example, if we take the case, very interesting case of Germany and the, vo the World uh, Football or Soccer Cup of the year 2006, in fact, for Germany, it was much, uh, this event was much more important 
than uh, purely kind of uh, a soccer uh, soccer uh, championship. It was an identity changing or identity making uh, event uh, because it was only uh, after the year 2006 that the Germans uh, were kind of publicly and en masse uh, eager to to expose and demonstrate their uh, the, the, their signs of belongingness to a political community. Uh, so that's a very good uh, very good uh, example how sports can foster uh, national uh, national identities. But in the meantime, we all know that each uh, mega event is also about articulating uh, cosmopolitan or transnational values or transnational identities. And sometimes we do see a clash between national and transnational identities, and that's what uh, Sochi Olympics is uh, basically about. On the one hand, we see a clear intention of the Kremlin to, uh, to, to use this project for uh, better articulating the, the new ideology of Russia, uh, racing from its knees and becoming a world uh, power again. But on the other hand, we see that uh, in many countries of the West. There is a, an idea to kind of transform Sochi Olympics into a kind of transnational celebration of uh, diversity, of uh, tolerance, etc., etc. And the issue with the LGBT community, I think, nicely fits into this kind of more cosmopolitan type of, um, uh, of discourse. Uh, there is one more uh, issue which uh, is uh, repeatedly raised by analysts and experts. The thing is that the growing number of sports mega events are hosted by non-Western countries. And this is a shift from the paradigm which we used to have for decades in which the West had, well, more or less a monopoly on uh, hosting, uh, hosting major sports events. Now the situation is, uh, changes. Of course, this is about kind of opening new markets. Uh, this is uh, a part of a kind of shifting uh, economic, um, uh, economic balance from the West to new emerging uh, countries. So there is, of course, an economic, uh, economic context in, in, this, uh, in this development. But in the meantime, it also raises a normative uh, type of question. Uh, whether the, 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 the growing number of uh, mega events hosted by countries like Russia, Brazil, or the World Football Cup in Qatar in the year 2022, for example, uh, would they trigger a normative effect? Uh, would they bring these non-Western countries closer to the Western normative order with the Western values and Western uh, political identities? Or vice versa, they would be used by local, uh, by, I'm sorry, by national elites uh, for uh, kind of making a stronger case and make, uh, making a stronger point in articulating uh, national identities as different uh, from, uh, uh, from those uh, uh, transnational and cosmopolitan values. Uh, of course, uh, in uh, many, many sports events, uh, we can easily identify normative, uh, normative dimensions or normative content. For example, uh, Moscow hosted recently world winners uh, games and you know this is uh, games for children who survived cancer so this is what this was a very good uh, uh, sports event with a very clear normative uh, normative message uh, we have a uh, homeless uh, world soccer cup so this is basically about social inclusion uh, this is also a very normative type of event uh, we have islamic solidarity uh, games with a very clear articulation of religious uh, identity and religious normativity. We have Mediterranean games, for example, in which the issues of, of belongingness to a certain uh, regional cultural milieu is uh, uh, very important. Uh, even cycling and skateboarding in academic literature sometimes are presented as uh, uh, practices uh, contesting uh, urban and, and, and social spaces, and in, in, in this sense also uh, based on a certain uh, normative, uh, normative background, normative uh, foundation. We have commercial normativity, for example, Gazprom uh, supports a uh, children's soccer uh, project in uh, a number of uh, 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 European countries, uh, to the best of my knowledge. But in the meantime, uh, when I speak about normativity, it's not always uh, about something really good and social inclusive. 
we have the other side of uh, normativity, at least in the Russian uh, sports. And I would give you a quotation uh, from uh, the president of uh, Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, who make a very explicit comment after uh, a soccer uh, arbiter uh, uh, has uh, beaten a player uh, just on the field. So the quotation is that he did break the law, but he did all right. I myself could have killed him, I mean the player, for that. We have that sort of traditions. So this is a very good, this is a very good uh, example of the way how sports event uh, or, or soccer uh, uh, game can be used for delivering a very clear uh, normative a message which places the, the issues of tradition uh, much above uh, uh, legal uh, legal norms. Or, for example, uh, we know that many incidents uh, are related to uh, uh, to sports. Uh, they they are based on relations of uh, enmity and uh, uh, othering. For example, the fans of uh, Zenit uh, football club in St. Petersburg they have burned the Chechen flag a, a couple of days ago which was, was also a very clear articulation of certain type of message, certain, certain type of uh, identity, uh, identity discourse. So conflicts are all, all, also part of this uh, normative, uh, uh, the, the normative context of, uh, uh, <coughs> of, uh, of sports. Uh, <coughs> I would also uh, draw your attention to uh, certain political implications of the normative debates, especially as soon as it comes to the Sochi Olympics and other mega events hosted by, let's say, non-Western uh, countries. Uh, a member of the International Olympic Committee, uh, Richard uh, Carrion, uh, a couple of weeks ago made a very strong declaration that in the future, the Olympic Games should not be held in countries with anti-gay legislation. And this was uh, for the first time when a, uh, uh, one of uh, members of the International Committee made that clear and that strong political point based on all those debates around the uh, LGBT uh, controversy uh, in Russia. Uh, and this is also the case with other uh, uh, countries uh, of Eastern Europe, like Bel Belarus, for example. Quite recently, the European Parliament passed a resolution calling for cancelling uh, the World Ice Hockey Championship in Belarus in the year 2014, saying that a country like Belarus has no right to host that huge uh, international, uh, international event. To some extent, this logic is uh, a new addition of the uh, political boycotting uh, campaign against Ukraine in the year 2012. Uh, and Germany was especially, uh, especially active and uh, 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 trying to, to push this political boycotting uh, campaign a couple of years ago, again uh, based on a very clearly articulated normative message that in a country where a leader of the opposition movement is uh, in jail, this country is not good for, uh, uh, for hosting uh, high-profile uh, international, uh, international events. So you see that we do have uh, this uh, kind of politicization of normative issues. And again, uh, my point here is that the Sochi project would certainly face the same type of uh, uh, political, uh, um, uh, political attitudes. Uh, Studying different uh, different discourses on uh, sports, politics, and uh, norms, uh, I would say that uh, the key uh, uh, the key controversy or the key gap between uh, and I'm speaking about uh, Sochi uh, right now uh, the key gap uh, between uh, let's say Russian position and the position of uh, those who call for taking certain measures against uh, Russia, especially based on this uh, LGBT issue, uh, boils down to different understanding or understandings of what is or what are normative, uh, what are universal norms and what are universal, universal values. For Russia, and in, in this case, uh, I, I would also draw your attention to the fact that Russia, Russian government, was always supported by the International Olympic Committee and uh, by FIFA, 
who is the, the organizer of the another major event in Russia in five years from now in the year 2018, the World uh, Soccer uh, Cup in 10 major Russian cities. So the key, uh, the key message from the Russian uh, government is that uh, the spirit of Olympism uh, disallows any expressions or any manifestations of uh, particularities beyond national symbols. So you can also only uh, expose, you can all, only make public your national symbols, your belongingness to, to, to a national team. But as soon as you uh, go public with, uh, with other identities, you can be other disqualified or you can be, uh, you can be uh, punished. And I would add to this, uh, to this point also that for, for the Kremlin, the whole LGBT issue is not about universal or universality of human rights. It, it, it's framed as a cultural or religious issue, but it's, it has nothing to do, I'm, I'm trying to reinterpret the, the way how the Kremlin uh, perceives this, it, it has nothing to do the, to the universality of human rights at all. And this, is, uh, uh, this stays in, in, in a stark contrast with, uh, with the LGBT global community, which claims that uh, human rights are universal. And if we speak about universality, we have to speak about non-discrimination, about tolerance, about dignity, and all these kind of uh, universal norms, which are applicable uh, far beyond specific, uh, specific uh, social, uh, social groups. Uh, what are the, uh, the weakest points uh, in, this, in, in, in these discourses, in the discourse of, of, of the Russian government, of the International Olympic Committee, and of uh, LGBT? Uh, concerning the International Olympic Committee uh, and other uh, major uh, sports uh, organizations which always uh, uh, support uh, host uh, governments and host uh, organizers in many, many, many issues, uh, they in fact prohibit public exposures of uh, any type of uh, political gestures. For example, a couple of years ago it was uh, a uh, high-profile uh, story in, uh, in, in Sweden when uh, the fans of the Belarusian uh, hockey team uh, made uh, uh, kind of public a different type of uh, flag. So, so you, have, you have two flags in, in, in Belarus. One is more or less official and the second is kind of of, of, of old uh, pre-Soviet times. And the very demonstration of these red and white flags was uh, a political gesture Per excellence, and the reaction of the Swedish authorities was to ban any type of public exposure of, of wrong flags, and this is the way how major uh, sports institutions uh, function. But the key problem with this type of attitude is that the very Olympic movement and other sports uh, movements is to a large extent part of uh, emancipatory politics with a very strong normative background, including issues of gender, racial equality, etc., etc., etc. So there is a logical trap in that kind of position taken by major sports, uh, sports institutions. Uh, well, for the Kremlin, I would say the key problem with uh, uh, its, its, its current position is that uh, it becomes clear that in order to successfully host Sochi Olympics, the Kremlin has to discontinue for, uh, for a short while, uh, temporarily discontinue, its uh, anti-gay legislation. And the very discontinuation of this legislation for a couple of weeks would of course serve as a very good symbol of uh, inadequacy of, uh, uh, of, that, uh, of that, uh, that legislation. I would say that there is a, a weak point in the LGD, uh, LGBT discourse as well. Because in my view, what they really need to do, they really need, need to make uh, much stronger the argument of uh, uh, kind of sustaining or explaining the universality of their claims, the universality of, the case, of their case. Because many uh, in Russia still uh, keep thinking that this is only about a certain particular group, and this is not related to other, uh, to other minorities cultural, sexual, etc., etc., etc. So I think there is still uh, some, uh, 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 some uh, way to go in uh, kind of more clearly articulating 
this uh, um, uh, this universal uh, background of the LGBT uh, message. And finally, I have one uh, or a couple of uh, final sentences. What would uh, be possible uh, strategies of uh, those uh, countries or those social groups uh, which are explicitly critical towards uh, the Kremlin uh, Sochi project and which uh, repeatedly raise a number of normative and political issues on the eve of the, of the Sochi Olympics. Uh, I th see at least three possible type, uh, types of strategy. First, uh, and we know all about this, is boycotting Russian goods, starting with vodka, uh, and potentially boycotting Western sponsors of the Olympics, uh, like Samsung, Volkswagen, Panasonic, and others. And that's what we have uh, in the media right now, that type, of, uh, that type of strategy. A second type of strategy was articulated by uh, Gary Kasparov, with the slogan, boycott Putin, not Sochi. And that would be a different type of strategy. So it's not a kind of uh, uh, sp uh, uh, about boycotting uh, the games as such, but it's about uh, refraining from uh, sitting with the leader of the country and shaking hands and celebrating this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, mega event. Uh, exactly the same, uh, the same type of political boycotting which, were, which was practiced by a number of European EU countries, especially Germany, when they said that shaking hands with Yanukovych uh, is not a good political gesture and it sends a wrong message to, to the whole Ukraine. And finally, there, uh, there is a third strategy, which uh, in particular was, uh, was articulated by Michael McFall, uh, the United States ambassador uh, to Moscow, who said that uh, it would be a very good idea to transform the Sochi Olympics from a kind of Putin-centric event to a more cosmopolitan celebration of, uh, of uh, diversity. And frankly speaking, uh, I, would, uh, I would work for, this, for, for the third option in this list uh, because I see that there is much more political potential in the third uh, type of strategy than in the first two. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Secondly, we're going to turn to Dr. Robert Ortung, who is an Associate Research Professor of International Affairs at the Elliott School at George Washington University. He's also the Assistant Director for the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at uh, George Washington. And he's a visiting fellow at the Center for Security Studies of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. He has his PhD from UCLA. He has worked for the Open Media Research Institute, the East-West Institute, the American University's Transnational Crime and Corruption Center, and the Jefferson Institute, and has published numerous articles in the Wall Street Journal, International Herald Tribune, Politico, Newsday, Moscow Times, and Nizavismaya Gazeta. And he's particularly an expert on energy politics and on the politics of uh, transnational crime and corruption. So Robert, take it away. Right. Thank you very much for the introduction. So what I'd like to do in my uh, talk is look at the political economy of the Sochi Olympics. And the main question I want to address is, why, why would Russia want to put on these Olympics? And, and sort of the big puzzle is that uh, the Olympics this time around cost $50 billion. And so we sort of get in, immune to these big numbers. But $50 billion is a lot more than all the other Olympics have cost in history. In fact, it's probably as much as all the Olympics have cost over time. And if you, even if you compare it to the Chinese Olympics in Beijing in 2008, they were about $40 billion. But I, I give you those numbers, um, but then I have to give you the asterisk, which says we don't even know if these numbers, what these numbers represent or if, if they're accurate at all. Partly, uh, obviously, because it's very opaque in Russia and in China. But even when you're looking at Olympics that are held in the West, it's very difficult to calculate uh, how much money was actually spent on them. Because you, you know how much stadiums cost, you know how much uh, different aspects of the Olympics cost, but you don't know um, how much money was spent on fixing up the city. And in the case of Sochi, they're putting huge amounts of money into building new airports, new roads, um, new sewer systems, new electrical generating plants. So it's like they're totally redeveloping the whole city. So, um, so that's kind of the puzzle. Why spend $50 billion on it? And so, so at a sort of superficial level, the appeal of the Olympics is pretty much obvious to everybody. It, it comes around once every two years, and billions of people watch it on TV. And what's you know, but you know that happens every day. Everyone's watching TV. But what's interesting about that is that people are willing to interrupt their daily routines to watch this. So you know, every, I'm sure most of us have memories growing up, and, and, and you know, 
even more recently, of you know putting aside work and, and watching the games or watching the opening ceremonies in London, that kind of thing. So for the 17 days of the competition, all, all eyes in the world basically are on the host country. So it's, it's good PR. So in, in Western countries where the Olympics have typically been, it, uh, the games are usually organized by local real estate developers, local tourist promoters. They're trying to get more attention to their city, you know, put it out there, build a global brand, so bring in more, more tourist dollars and hopefully get the federal government to devote more money to developing your city, like a place like Los Angeles or Salt Lake City, Atlanta. But uh, in the case of the Sochi games, the real initiator is Putin. And so if you, you know, look at some of the stuff that's online, like the opposition politician Boris Nemtsov has a lot of reports on, on Sochi, and he argues it was actually the oligarch Vladimir Potanin who suggested the idea of bringing the Olympics to Russia and it was the governor of Krasnodar Krai, where Sochi, the city of Sochi is located, who, who sort of proposed the location. But Putin clearly is an, is an avid sportsman, as we've seen from all his pictures on the internet. He's a big skier. He loves to hang out in Sochi. So it wasn't a hard sell. So, so, so the games in Russia are a little different than, than you would have typically in the West because of this distinction of, of who's actually the force behind it, not the local uh, developers, but, but the national leader. So I want to actually, in my talk, just quickly go through three reasons why the Olympics are important to Putin and why they're important to Russia. And the first is building up Russia's international image. And I'll just talk about that briefly. And then the second reason is um, the Olympics provide a way to define the priorities for developing Russia. So it kind of provides a plan for where Russia should be going into the future. And the third reason, which is the most important reason, is that Putin's using these as a way of maintaining regime stability. Like this is how he, he's keeping himself in power. So first, let me look at the uh, building up Russia's international image. And the, the, the Russians, of course, it's not the first time the Olympics have been in, in, in Russia or the Soviet Union. The, the games obviously took place more or less in 1980 when Jimmy Carter boycotted them in, in, in Moscow. But you know, before that, the Soviets, uh, initially they were not part of the Olympic movement, but they joined it in 1952. And they saw it as a way of promoting socialism and its achievements to a global audience. So they, they clearly had propaganda reasons uh, behind their initial decision to join up with the Olympic movement. And they used the 1980 games, hoping to showcase the city and the Communist Party achievements. And they achieved that goal to some extent. Obviously, the US and a few other countries weren't there because of the invasion of Afghanistan. But now, uh, in, in our age, you know, post-communism, Putin hopes to use the games to show that Russia can compete in the capitalist system, just like all the other capitalist countries. And so Russia uh, kind of sees itself like some of the other countries that are hosting the games these days, like China, South Africa, Brazil, you know, both with the Olympics and the World Cup soccer games. Russia sees itself as one of the rising nations. That's, uh, even though it's been up there, and now it was down, and now it's coming back up. And, and the Olympics is one of the ways of showing uh, that the country is back. And certainly Japan is using this as a way of, of reasserting itself. And it, it just won the 2020 games. So the, using the Olympics is a good way to promote your national brand on the international stage. And of course, what's different here, like if you look at the Los Angeles Olympics, uh, which took place in 1984, and that's when I was growing up in Southern California, so I remember them very well. But they were organized purely by businessmen. So it was sort of, it was called the Coca-Cola Olympics, the Capitalist Olympics. It was businessmen, the city leaders had nothing to do with it really. But in this case, even though Putin's kind of presenting himself as a capitalist, it's clearly a state-defined capitalism because he's the one running the show. It's not the private businessmen. They're involved, but they're doing what he's telling them to do. So the, the second reason why the Olympics are, are important to Russia and to Putin is it resolves a major development question. And this is the same basic question that we face here in the United States. And, and you can see this battle going on between the Democrats and the Republicans. It's like, where should we spend our money? Should we, basically the question is, should we invest in the, in the rich, the people who have succeeded, and hope that they'll bring up the rest of the population? Or should we try and build a minimal level of development uh, you know, for all of Americans? And so it, that's like the basic debate that we see going on in the United States. And in Russia, it, it takes that, that same basic form, but it, it's more uh, a spatial form. Russia is a big country, 
So Putin and the government are trying to figure out how should they develop the regions all around Russia? Should they concentrate their money in a few locomotive regions, you know, places like Sochi, or other cities around the country that can bring up the rest of the country? Or should they try and spread out the wealth and develop a level of equality, try and bring everybody up to a minimum level? And so this debate's going on, obviously, in the United States. It's sort of come to a standstill in, in the Congress. Um, and it's basically come to a standstill in Russia. They can never really decide. And so what's happened with the Olympics is that basically it's a de facto decision to concentrate money on a few key regions. And so you have several mega projects, as Andre mentioned, going on in Russia. Just last year, they spent $20 billion developing Vladivostok for a summit of Asia Pacific leaders and built a big bridge to an island that nobody ever goes to and there's nothing there, but you know, I think it didn't matter. In Kazan, we had the Universiad this summer, which is a big sports event. That cost $7 billion, but it, it really helped develop the whole city, totally uh, changed much of the, the landscape, the urban landscape. Sochi is getting $50 billion and also a total overhaul. In 2018, Russia is going to host the World Cup. So that's about 10 or 11 cities that will get this huge amount of investment again. You know, mostly, mostly it'll include new airports, new roads, new hotel infrastructure, new stadiums. And so this is a way of picking and choosing where the investment dollars in Russia should go. And so Putin's clearly decided to focus on these key regions. And a big benefit of that, of course, is that he's taking the money out of Moscow. And, you know, so his political base is outside in the rural areas where, in the rural non-Moscow non areas in particular, because the people in Moscow, they're sort of urban hipsters all on the internet, and they're all basically anti-Putin. Well, to some extent. But anyway, so, so clearly Putin has a political base, and that's the base out, out, out in the countryside. And so he's focusing a lot of the resources out there, and, and these mega projects like the Olympics are helping him do that. And then so the final, the third reason that this is important, and probably the most important reason, is that uh, having these Olympics helps Putin stay in power. And so it does that by a number of ways, by uh, addressing uh, interest for the masses and for the elites. And so for the masses, the Olympics are like a beauty contest because they promote world peace. And that's the goal, right? The Olympic goal, and even, you know, the UN is just debating how to have a, um, a treaty where everyone agrees not to fight each other during the, during the time that the Olympics take place. So the overall goal of Olympism is, is promoting world peace. And so that's kind of an ideology that can uh, fill the void that's left over after communism. Sort of Russia has a bigger purpose, which is promoting world peace. And you can sort of see that in the way Putin presents his initiatives, for example, in Syria. You know, you, you have to ignore everything else that's going on in the country. But at least in, in Syria, momentarily, they're promoting world peace. But the Olympics have a double-edged sword, of course, because they're also promoting nationalism, right? Because each country is trying to get as many medals as possible, and, and you know, the, the usual competition between the countries is going on, of course, in a peaceful way. And so that also helps Putin, because it gives people a sense of pride in their country. And so that, that's another reason that the masses really enjoy it. You know, everybody loves the Olympics. It's very hard to criticize the Olympics. Uh, it makes people feel proud. Um, and, and in a way that actually demobilizes the population. It gets people out of politics. It gets them you know, watching TV, at least for those two weeks. And it makes it much more difficult for the political opposition in Russia, to the extent that it exists, to criticize Putin, because he's sort of seen as the guy who brought the Olympics there. And so that makes him more popular with the people. And then at the elite level, the Olympics are very important because you're just, basically they're a way of distributing money to the key groups that matter, the, you know, the so-called selectorate in Russia, the, the 100 or 200 people that could push Putin out of power if they decided they didn't like him anymore. And so, um, and that's why you have the $50 billion price tag, right? So he's giving lots of money to the, the seal of key, the police, the military, the security agencies who have a new job in protecting Sochi from terrorists. He's giving lots of money to the oligarchs and the big business people who are getting contracts to build the Olympic facilities and that sort of thing. And if you look at uh, the price tags on the stadiums that are being built in Russia and compare them to the price tags for stadiums, similar stadiums that are built in the West, the ones in Russia cost three to four times as much as the ones in the West. So that gives you a sense of how much of the money is actually being stolen, uh, not, not going into the facilities or developing the city, but going into payoffs to different groups that Putin needs to stay in power. And a clear sign of this is that uh, the Russian Olympics 
instead of being or organized by the usual Olympic organizing committee, are organized by a special state corporation called Olympstroy. So the, the organizing committees that are usually set up are directly accountable to the International Olympic Committee, which itself is not very transparent, but nonetheless it does sort of provide an international accountability. But after Putin and Russia won the bid, they set up this separate corporation that's actually running all the show, and the people in the organizing committee don't really have any power. They have to go to the people in Olympstroy, which is much more, much less transparent. And so that's where the money is kind of churning around and being siphoned off to the, the people where it needs to go. So just a few concluding thoughts. And the basic idea with the Olympics, if you look at it from this sort of political economy perspective, is that there's a small circle of winners. So in a sense, you know, the broader population wins because they're getting tangible things like pride and happiness, and that's nothing, nothing to uh, be ashamed of. There's a really good book, Soccer Economics, Soccernomics, like Freakonomics, but Soccernomics that explains, you know, tries to understand why, why would countries spend so much money on these events. And if you measure things like gross, gross national happiness, it tends to go up considerably during these games, and, e and even afterwards, there's a measurable impact that people are happier because these games took place. So, so that's undeniable. And in terms of, but in terms of material rewards, it's uh, going to the small group of people around Putin as usual, and to a few key cities like Sochi, and then other projects in Vladivostok, Kazan, different places. Uh, but the, the key question, and this is not only for Russia, but for any, any city that hosts the Olympics, um, is, you know, does it really make sense to spend so much money on these big sports projects when you could have spent that same amount of money, $50 billion, on, you know, things like affordable housing, more park space, more athletic facilities that people can actually use? And is it really fair that the other regions don't get any of this spending? It's all being concentrated in a few cities. So basic conclusion is that overall, the Sochi Olympics, which are already the most expensive Olympics in history and they haven't even happened yet, is that they uh, seem much better designed to sh to benefit the short-term interests of the ruling elites in Russia than the longer-term uh, desires and aspirations of the Russian population. So in this sense, it's a good case study of sort of the overall political system in Russia and its overall path of development. So, Thank you, Robert. <laughs> so third, we will turn to Dr. Sufyan Zhmukhov who is the Hayward Isham Visiting Scholar in Russian and East European Studies at George Washington University. He earned his PhD at the Institute of Ethnology of Moscow's Russian Academy of Science. He worked in the city of Nalchik, which is the capital of the Russian Republic of kabardino balkaria as director of the Teacher Training Institute and editor-in-chief of the newspapers kabardino balkarskaya Pravda um, and The Voice of Kabarda, where he has been since 2011. He's a former Kenan Fulbright Scholar, and he recently received fellowships from the U.S. Institute of International Education and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. He's an expert on um, uh, issues that are related to um, ethnicity and genocide. He's written several books. He is a specialist on Islam and has performed the Hajj. And he's also a specialist on the Circassian people, and he became a director of the NGO, the non-governmental organization, um, known as the 2012 World uh, Circassian Games. So, Sufyan. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, I will talk about international pressure and Russia's response to the threat of uh, Olympic boycott. Russia faces many unresolved issues, uh, any of which could escalate rapidi rapidly during the uh, short uh, time frame leading up to the Olympics. Part of those problems uh, come uh, are of uh, Soviet legacy. Another part emerged uh, the last, during the last two decades of existence of the new Russian state. These problems include uh, Russian diaspora pro problems in Baltic states, uh, political pressure in Moldova and uh, breakaway Transnistria, Russian-Georgian relations uh, in light of uh, 2008 war and Russia's recognition of Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia, managing relations with Baku and Yerevan, the U.S. military transit center in Kyrgyzstan, tensions in Russian-Ukrainian relations. You, you can... Uh, uh, the, the, the list can go on and on, and even uh, Russia has 
such uh, problems inherited from Soviet Union as unresolved territorial disputes with Japan. Uh, so clearly some foreign countries and NGOs are already trying to capitalize on a globalized nature of the Olympic Games to urge the Kremlin to come to terms with, the, with these problematic uh, topics. And uh, I want to address uh, uh, a question, what patterns have emerged in the Kremlin's, Kremlin's responses to major issues and uh, challenges uh, in recent uh, years? I will focus on how the Kremlin handles international pressure and firstly how it reflects <coughs> the Kremlin's policy, foreign policy toward post-Soviet states and secondly uh, how it reflects uh, Kremlin's policy toward the West. In the post-Soviet space Russia has reputation as rather having rather aggressive foreign policy and during the past two decades and especially uh, since 2000s Russia played uh, many times on uh, weakness, weaknesses of its neighbors and uh, used all kinds of instrument uh, against uh, post-Soviet uh, countries from uh, trade sanctions to actual military invasions. But how does Moscow itself react to neighbors' attempt to coercion? The case of the 2014 Olympics demonstrates that the Kremlin stands firm against such uh, <coughs> threats. One of the most, uh, one of the best examples of Russian responses to this kind of challenge is the responses to Georgia. In uh, 2007 when Russia won the bid to hold Olympics, to host Olympics, uh, the president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, was the first, one of the first who called him uh, on the phone and congratulated on, the, uh, on this occasion and offered uh, any kind of support. But uh, Tbilisi's enthusiasm didn't uh, soften Moscow's position over Russian-Georgian relations. And in spite of the fact that Sochi is very close to the Georgian border, Russia did not hesitate to declare war against Georgia in August 2008. For the, furthermore, after the war, Russia recognized independence of two uh, Georgian territories, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And after that, Georgia tried to use instrument uh, of boycotting and uh, uh, threat of even canceling the Olympics in political as a political instrument. And so in September 2008, next ma month after the August 2008 war, Georgia applied to International Olympic Committee requesting that the Games not to be held in Sochi because it's so close to the territory occupied by Russians uh, in Abkhazia. But uh, International Olympic Committee didn't respond to that uh, request positively. Then, Georgia, in May, May 2011, the Georgian parliament recognized the Circassian genocide, which took place in uh, 1864 in uh, Sochi, the last capital of a uh, Circassian state. And this was a direct threat for the Olympics because uh, since uh, one of the countries recognized uh, that there was genocide in Sochi, uh, the <coughs> Olympic Constitution, the Olympic uh, chart clearly says that uh, uh, Olympics cannot be held 
on the land of genocide. But uh, after, so, so how uh, Kremlin responded to uh, those threats? Actually, uh, in 2008, during one of the press conferences, Putin formulated the Kremlin's policy toward the challenge of Olympic boycott. He said, I quote, if they do it once, that is, if they cancel the Olympics, uh, if they do it once, it will destroy the entire structure of Olympic movement. However, on the other hand, if they want to take the Sochi Games away, let them take on this burden." End of quote. And indeed, neither, neither the August 2000 war, nor the occupation of uh, Georgian territory next to Sochi, nor the UN resolutions against Russia for years to come, nor the recognition of Sochi as a territory where genocide was committed. Nothing has made the International Olympic Committee change its decision to hold the Olympics in Sochi. This is not actually su surprising. In the past, the Olympic uh, Committee has tolerated even bigger controversies. For example, it did not move the 1980 Moscow Olympics in, in spite of uh, Soviet invasion to Afghanistan, uh, and it did not, uh, uh, I don't compare these two cases, but it did not uh, move uh, 1984 Los Angeles Games, which was boycotted by the Soviet Union, it, it, its allies in response. So uh, how did it lead, uh, w why uh, Kremlin acts like that on the uh, post-Soviet space? And could it act a uh, different way? We can uh, say that uh, Russia could actually interfere with Georgian parliament's recognition of uh, Circassian genocide in 2011. Because just a few months after that, Russia was accepted in a WTO and the last country that voted for that was Georgia. And uh, to that time, Russia didn't have any diplomatic uh, relations with Georgia. And Russia did it with the help of Washington, which advised Tbilisi to vote for uh, exception, uh, to, to accept Russia in uh, WTO. We don't know what uh, uh, was the bargain, what was the trade, political, diplomatic uh, bargaining between uh, the US and Russia uh, to pressure Georgia, but apparently Russia could use the same uh, trick, the same tool to uh, pressure Georgia not to recognize uh, the genocide. So why didn't uh, Kremlin do that? Apparently, mm, Russia has a lot of uh, challenges on post-Soviet uh, post space. And if the, Kre uh, the Kremlin's policy indicates that they think that if they give in once to anybody, then the other states will start using the same tool. And so apparently uh, the Kremlin and Putin wanted to show on the uh, uh, Georgia case that they we are willing to go the, uh, all the way uh, to boycott, to uh, the war, even with held a war, wouldn't stop uh, at military operations, but uh, never will give in. Uh, the same... Um, we, we see the same problem on domestic uh, side as well, because uh, the Circassians apply for recognition of genocide themselves, uh, apart from uh, Georgian recognition. And if uh, the Kremlin's policy is to resist that, because uh, it's not a secret that during the violent Russian history, a lot of uh, ethnicities, nationalities, 
uh, experienced genocide uh, in 19th century, in uh, 20th century. So if uh, the Kremlin thinks that if they recognize one genocide, other, nation, uh, other nationalities in Russia will uh, raise that issue, including probably the, uh, the Russian nation itself, which uh, during Soviet time was uh, uh, suffered most from Stalin's ex experiments. And indeed, uh, we can see, n not probably directly, but somehow indirectly, that on international, on post-Soviet space, this policy paid off. And in 2013, Tbilisi uh, changed its position uh, uh, after a uh, new government uh, of uh, Ivanashvili was elected. And uh, Ivanashvili announced that Georgia would not boycott the 2014 Olympics. And uh, we can uh, clearly indicate that this shift in Tbilisi's policy was the result of the change in uh, Georgia's government rather than the result uh, of uh, any uh, Kremlin's uh, uh, attempt to resolve these issues. But what we see on the other uh, side, on the, uh, what is the Kremlin's policy toward the West? Uh, Russian-British relations in uh, recent years are the best example of uh, uh, that shows how Russian policy changed toward the West in connection with the Olympics. Uh, everybody remembers that uh, recently in 2006 there was huge tension between Russia and Great Britain due to the assassination of uh, former KGB uh, agent uh, Alex uh, Alexander Litvinenko in uh, London and uh, several years after that Russia and uh, Great Britain experienced deep crisis uh, deep diplomatic crisis and another uh, case uh, with uh, so, so we, we can see that Russia uh, stood up we could say Russia stood up to uh, Great Britain uh, in that case. In other uh, case when Russia stood up to a Western uh, country was uh, when uh, the US Congress adopted so-called Magnitsky's case and prohibited uh, some Russian uh, bureaucrats uh, uh, openly uh, included uh, some Russian bu bureaucrats in uh, a list prohibiting them to enter the U.S. And after that, Russian uh, parliament adopted uh, uh, so-called Dima Yakovlev's uh, list, prohibiting some uh, uh, American uh, bureaucrats to enter Rus Russia. After that, uh, Magnitsky's list was adopted by British parliament. And you would think that Russia would uh, do uh, symmetric uh, response to London as well, but Russia didn't. Uh, the same was with uh, uh, EU Parliament, which recommended, uh, EU Parliament didn't adopt Magnitsky's list, but recommended to European countries uh, to do that. And uh, Moscow again didn't respond to that. And it has actually, it shows that uh, in the West, uh, Kremlin's policy is much more flexible than uh, in the post-Soviet space. Uh, this, we, we see the same with uh, the threat of uh, boycotting Olympics. Uh, the first uh, U.S. boycott threat emerged in September 2008 as a reaction to the Russian-Georgian war, when uh, U.S. representatives uh, Alison Schwartz and Bill Schuster uh, introduced Congress Resolution Number no. Two, uh, Number no. Four Hundred Twelve, called uh, "No Russian Olympics in 2014." 
But at the time, uh, the reset policy made the idea of uh, boycott politically irrelevant. And between 2008 and 2013, there were no discussions in the U.S. of boycotting the Sochi Olympics. But recently, the threat of U.S. boycott again emerged during the scandal connected with uh, Edward Snowden, when in July 16, Senator Lindsey uh, Lindsey Graham, Graham uh, suggested that the U.S. should boycott Olympics if uh, Russia would grant uh, Snowden asylum. And he didn't have any support uh, at the time in the, uh, in the public. So Russia announced that uh, it may grant asylum to Snowden. But uh, to the time, uh, uh, in the time between uh, the first initiative in July and uh, uh, the suggestion of uh, the Kremlin to uh, grant Snowden asylum, uh, the public opinion shifted uh, in the US and in the West because of LGBT uh, issue and uh, the Kremlin miscalculated uh, its uh, move and uh, escalated uh, the tension. And uh, actually, President Obama responded uh, to that by canceling meeting with Putin. And uh, for the first time, he referenced uh, to possibility of Olympic boycott. Uh, actually, he uh, said that uh, uh, he referenced it negatively, but nevertheless, he mentioned it uh, as a possibility. And again, Kremlin didn't uh, respond sym symmetrically and did not cancel the 2013 meeting between the U.S. Secretaries of State and Defense and the Russian Ministers of Foreign Affairs and Defense, which followed right after uh, the cancellation of a meeting between the presidents. So we see that in uh, the West and in the post-Soviet space, uh, the response to threat of the Olympic boycotts uh, reflect the different uh, Russian policy to. Uh, uh, toward uh, these different uh, parts of the world. And we can uh, see that uh, Sochi Olympics uh, can be uh, treated as diplomatic capital on international stage. And such a tool actually may be used several times as uh, in case of Georgia, when at first Georgia announced in 2008 its intention to boycott Olympics and later in 2013 used uh, the games to restore relations with Sochi and actually there are recent rumors that Georgia may change its mind and may announce again that it would be boycotting the Olympics because the new Georgian government did not see any positive responses to its initiatives from the Kremlin side. The Kremlin, for its part, is kind of hostage to the Olympics, and it deals with the challenge that may lead to negative uh, publicity of boycott. And uh, in the conclusion, we can uh, state that so far, the Kremlin navigated this course with a firm, and, uh, with a firm hand toward neighbors like Georgia and more flexibilities with the waste, and actually, it would be sensational if uh, a country, any country, does boycott the Olympics. But truth be told, even if a boycott took place, it would be not fatal blow to the Kremlin and the games would go on. Thanks. Thank you, Sufjan. Um, and so finally, uh, we have uh, Dr. Raymond Terrace who is the Fulbright, Fulbright Distinguished Chair in European Studies at the University of Warsaw in Poland, where he earlier earned his PhD. Um, he is on leave as a professor at Tulane University in New Orleans. 
He has authored or edited close to 20 books, served in academic positions at Harvard, Stanford, the European University Institute, and Momu University, where he has been the Willie Brandt Professor. Um, and he is really one of the leading lights um, in scholarship on um, identity politics, ethnic politics, nationalism, um, uh, all of the sort of theoretical background uh, to those kinds of questions. So take it away. Uh, double thanks, Kim, both for uh, this un undeserved praise uh, <laughs> and for organizing this wonderful event. And uh, it, uh, it has drawn, uh, I think, a very engaged uh, group of people here. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, something different, I think, from qualitatively from uh, what has been done as, as terrific as it has been on the Sochi Games uh, on this panel. Uh, and that is uh, to uh, actually look at the events as um, the Sochi, Sochi Games uh, more in a sporting light. Uh, the reason I came to uh, this type of approach is because uh, as we prepared a book on the Sochi Olympics, I learned about the critical uh, Circassian narrative and the critical Georgian narrative and the critical American na narrative and uh, Russians critical of the games. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm originally from Canada, you'll soon uh, realize that um, from what I'll be saying about the, the events. Um, uh, and, and then I'd, I'd, I decided I'd search Canadian newspapers to see uh, what type of uh, coverage uh, there were for the preparations for the Olympics. Uh, and the first one I, I uh, the first article I found was uh, was startling because the title was uh, "The Russian Bear Has Got Its Growl Back," and I thought to myself, like, "This is really going back to Cold War days." <laughs> uh, it turned out that the the, the growl was uh, the Russian figure skating team, uh, which was becoming stronger by by the month and therefore a major threat to uh, Canadian. Uh, Canadian um, uh, uh, figure skating um, uh, prospects. So what I want to do in this titled uh, paper, Snow, Ice, uh, and Vertical Drops, what's different about the Sochi Games, is to document what has gone wrong with the previous five uh, Winter Olympics, and then to have us ask the question whether there's something really exceptional about the problems that are uh, alleged to be plaguing the, uh, the Sochi Games. Uh, Preparations for every Olympics uh, are the subject of much criticism, I found out. Are there particularly mm -hmm. pathological uh, features to the Sochi Games? Is, is, or, or, or are we dealing uh, with Russophobia, uh, that Russians can never do anything right? <clears throat> um, so what I want to do is look at 20 years worth of criticism of the previous uh, five games uh, and see what, uh, what the problems were. Uh, all these other Olympic Games uh, were held in mountain regions. Uh, these are the first Winter Games to be staged in the northern country, but ironically in the southern seaside resort. Um, so that itself is already something exceptional. Uh, it's not heavy-handedness by Putin or Putin's uh, sort of uh, in investment decisions. The very fact that these games are in such a, um, a, a subtropical uh, area mm -hmm. Uh, is, is, is uh, as, as, as I started thinking about it, perhaps this is to prepare us for, uh, for a very serious global warming where all Winter Olympics will be <laughs> held in seaside resorts. Um, um, there has been a linear evolution in uh, the size, visibility, and impact of each succeeding Winter Olympics. I say that they correspond roughly to the Olympic motto that is assigned to athletes, faster, higher, stronger. And we see in the case of the Sochi Games more and more spending, but that was said above Vancouver four years ago and before that other places as well. I think the gold standard in terms of the, uh, the best Winter Olympics ever held was in 1994, 20 years ago, uh, in, uh, in Lillehammer, in, uh, in a small Norwegian uh, town. Uh, up on the uh, on, on the fjord, um, Oslo had hosted the games in 1952. Uh, it had beaten out uh, a Swedish rival by uh, 45 votes to 39. Sweden has applied, made bids four or five times. Has never ever won uh, the right to hold uh, Winter Olympics. Um, these were really the last Winter Olympics in Lillehammer to be held in a smaller town uh, before they came to Sochi. Um, mm. Norway at these games topped the medals count, uh, ahead of Germany and uh, Russia. 
Uh, but what I really like uh, in the case of, uh, of the analysis of the Lillehammer games is the wonderful uh, literary um, narrative uh, that, that, that praises what really happened in, uh, in Lillehammer. <clears throat> and this is written by an American uh, journalist uh, named Montville. And he asks, where are the Americans? I've been to the Olympics before, and I've never been to one where the dominant group on the street wasn't some star-spangled expense account herd, um, everyone complaining about the prices and the weather. Where are these people this time? So the great thing about the Lillehammer Games was the, the, uh, the, the, the disappearance into the woodwork of, uh, of, of American uh, sports tourists. The Cold War was pronounced dead uh, in Lillehammer. The games were a long time struggle between East and West, with medal counts as important as missile counts to the US and to the uh, members of the dreaded Eastern Bloc. But in Lillehammer, here, sport was sport. The competitors were people rather than representatives of an ideology or a way of life. So this American journalist, Montville, concluded, the host country was engulfed by sweetness. When had any small country ever made such big noises? With its 26 medals topping the overall medal count, Norway became an athletic colossus. Every night seemed to feature another Norwegian standing on the victory stand. Um, what could be sweeter than that? The real Olympic champion was the small town of Lillehammer itself and the people of Norway. But there was yet a final dose of lyricism. It, uh, which I interpret as a pain to all Nordic countries. When I read this out, this account, this praise of Lillehammer uh, to a Swedish uh, audience, uh, they were very, very upset that I was unduly praising Norwegians. <laughs> so I've now decided that this really applies to all Nordic peoples, uh, Finns and Swedes and, uh, and Danes and so on. The, so wonderful, wonderful lyricism. This is great sports journalism, which maybe occurs uh, regularly at Olympic, uh, Olympic events. The buildings here in Lillehammer are constructed of gingerbread. The snow is really ice cream. The king of Norway is named Hansel, and the queen uh, is named Gretel. The only way to reach this country is to fall through a wide rabbit hole to be swept away by a cyclone. The capital is Oz, not Oslo. Um, the, 17th Winter Olympics did not exist. Norway did not exist. These were the fairy tale games, drawn from the imagination, staged in the pages of a children's book. They could not exist. Reality cannot be this good. So uh, I start off by describing a Winter Olympics which seemed to have gone flawlessly. There was snow, there was no uh, melting of, uh, of snow and ice, the, the typical problems that now have arisen uh, for all, uh, almost all Winter Olympic Games. In 1998, Nagano uh, was the host of the Games. Uh, I haven't been to Nagano, I have been to uh, Sapporo, in, which held the Games in 1972, but at very, very different locations. Um, uh, the, the Nagano receives a heavy snowfall, it is argued, about 100 inches a year. Well, uh, I, I have lived in a place like Winter Park, Colorado, and, it, and, that, and that gets about 380 inches, nearly four times as much uh, snow as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Nagano does. Japan, Japan's largest ski resort is located uh, in Nagano, but the games were, uh, were plagued by rain, sleet, fog, uh, alpine skiing was postponed for more than a week. Um, at 36.6 degrees latitude north, Nagano represents the southernmost ever host of the Winter Olympics. Even Sochi lies further north at 43.6 latitude north, but it is, after all, on the Black Sea. Um, uh, 72 nations, and the number is climbing, uh, competed across 72 events, and that is cr uh, climbing as well. Among new Olympic sports were women's hockey, uh, four snowboarding events, uh, men's hockey finally allowed NHL players uh, to take uh, part, uh, but the NHL players had to uh, stay in the Olympic Village like other athletes, no five-star hotels for, uh, for them. Um, Kenya sent its first ever athlete to the Winter Olympics in Nagano. Uh, and uh, the greatest controversy in, Nag in Nagano, unlike in Lillehammer, 
uh, which involved female figure skaters. It was the Tanya Harding, uh, Nancy Kerrigan, which, which was to, to this day has, uh, has had the highest viewing ratings of any Winter Olympics of, of, and of all kinds. So forget about the gingerbread house and so on. It was Kerrigan and, um, and, um, and Harding that really made this such a visible event, Lillehammer. But in, uh, in the case of Nagano, it was the Canadian who won the inaugural men's giant slalom. Uh, he failed uh, a doping test because of a positive result for marijuana. Uh, he was stripped of his gold medal. He appealed his disqualification on the grounds that the International Snowboarding Federation, run by young snowboarders, you can imagine how unsympathetic they were to the disqualification, <laughs> Um, decided that uh, mar marijuana was not on its list of banned substances. Uh, they believed that stone snowboarders gain no competitive edge, uh, even if their experience may be enhanced shooting down a steep incline and flying to the air as high as kites. Um, the border was from Whistler, British Columbia. I don't know how many of you have been to Whistler for skiing, but, uh, uh, or for mountain biking for that matter, but that's where uh, BC Bud uh, is, uh, is very uh, well, uh, well known. Pot there is, uh, uh, is estimated to be 10 times stronger than average marijuana. It's estimated that 80% of the people who live in Whistler smoke pot. Uh, the disqualified boarder added to his appeal by saying he had been exposed to secondhand marijuana smoke <laughs> since he did not live in a drug-free zone. Um, the Canadian won his appeal and retained his, uh, his gold medal. Uh, 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 but the, uh, the, sno the Snowboarding Association said that uh, it really uh, is, uh, is, is not advisable to do any testing of snowboarders uh, anyway. So this was the takeaway, that uh, snowboarders shouldn't be tested for drugs and, uh, at all. Now, Salt Lake City in 2002 had a lot of controversies that we know about. It's my home city at the present time. Um, I live there when I'm not uh, teaching in New Orleans or uh, elsewhere. Uh, it won uh, one-sidedly in, uh, in, in Olympic voting, 54 to 14. Uh, it was at the time, interestingly, the most popular city ever to host the Winter Games, uh, but it was followed by Turin and Vancouver, uh, that, also, that were lo even larger cities than Salt Lake is. The proliferation of events continued. Uh, the television-friendly formula adopted by the International Olympic Committee paid dividends. Over 2 billion viewers around the world watched more than 13 billion hours mm -hmm. of coverage. The celebrity uh, dimensions of the Games were ratcheted up to new heights. Closing ceremonies included a performance by Kiss, um, Christina Aguilera, uh, Dave Matthews, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, the Dixie Chicks, who uh, shortly afterwards became blacklisted for their opposition to the invasion of Iraq, for uh, classical music fans, Yo-Yo Ma, and of course, a must-see, must Dave Rigger was the Mormon tab Tabernacle Choir, who I recently saw just two weeks ago playing with Charles uh, James Taylor. Uh, the Mormon church president, uh, Gordon Hinckley, uh, interpreted playing to the host of the games in theological terms. Um, so, you know, we have these uh, Russian uh, politicians uh, you know, providing various interpretations of the meaning of these games to Russia, but uh, Mormon President um, Hinckley said it was a fulfillment of Mormon pioneer uh, Brigham Young's prophecy that kings and emperors and the noble and the wise of the earth would one day visit the home city of the, of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, so. Um, this, uh, this prophecy, as all church presidents in the LDC uh, are, ex uh, are, are assumed to be able to carry out prophecy, uh, came through. Uh, Hinckley also said that um, uh, he, it would be possible to get an alcoholic drink uh, in Salt Lake during the Winter Olympics. So I don't think that's an issue that's going to uh, plague Sochi. Uh, uh, but, um, but, but anyway, there is a Mormon, pro Mormon prohibition on the prohibition of unhealthy beverages. It never says specifically alcohol, it says unhealthy beverages. That's why alcohol and Coca-Cola are put side by side, and you know, neither are good. Um, one IOC member said he could not get a drink in Salt Lake during the Olymp Olympics. Uh, it was also very, very important is securitization. We can talk uh, an awful lot. A lot of research is probably focused on securitization of the Sochi Games because of various types of security threats. Uh, Salt Lake passed off without any problems, even though it was literally five months after 9-11. Uh, the events were uh, marked uh, largely by uh, remembrance, but also uh, fear. 
there was uh, ec uh, an economic scandal. Uh, the organizing committee uh, um, uh, was accused of having shown IOC members um, uh, largesse. Uh, the, uh, it was alleged that the daughter of a foreign member of the IOC was attending an American university, and a good one at that, as I remember, uh, uh, with tuition paid for by the Salt Lake Olympic Committee. Uh, the committee's repost was that Salt Lake was playing by the same rules as uh, other bid cities had done. And nevertheless, two committee members had to resign, sub subsequently ind indicted by the U.S. Department of Justice. These indictments were in, in turn turned out eventually by a judge. Uh, this created a vacuum that uh, Mitt Romney, uh, now that he's not a presidential candidate, very eff effectively stepped into as organizing committee head. Uh, he, although a practicing Mormon, which made him very popular in the, uh, in the Salt Lake Valley, he, Valley, he turned the Winter Olympics preparations uh, around, and uh, the, those Olympics uh, generated a surplus of 40 million. The weather also co co cooperated as well. I won't get into the details since I realize I'm running out of time, but it was largely cold, clear weather, and when you talk about skiing in Utah, you've always got to remember it's the best, it's the greatest snow on earth. Uh, and uh, environmentalists also were very, very successful at Salt Lake in blocking any Olympic events in the Cottonwood Canyons, which are very, very close to, uh, to Salt Lake, uh, where the vertical drops and this pitch of the, uh, of the runs and Alta and Snowbird and Brighton and Solitude are very, very challenging. Uh, uh, but uh, but b because uh, uh, these are watersheds, uh, there are no, no Winter Olympics events were actually held in these wonderful, wonderful ski, uh, ski areas. Um, when it comes to hockey, Canada came back. Wayne Gretzky, uh, who was general manager of Team Canada, sunk a Canadian loony, uh, which is a $1 coin, uh, because it has a picture of a loony, a duck, a geese, something like that. Under the ice surface for good luck before the games began, Canada beat the United States 5-2. Motivated by the presence of Gretzky and other members of Team Canada, uh, uh, and also motivated by the burning of the Canadian flag by the American women's hockey team, shame on them, uh, which had previously won the women's, uh, the previous women Olympic champion. The Canadian women's team came uh, 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 from behind and, and won the gold medal by beating the United States 3-2. Uh, a new selection procedure uh, following the Salt Lake Games was introduced by the IOC. I won't get into the details, except it was not so easy now to bribe uh, IOC uh, officials. You'd end up with a long list where IOC representatives would not get to visit these various cities on the long list, uh, and that would cut out a lot of the kind of uh, bribery and largesse uh, that uh, was, was thrown their way when they would visit this uh, list of cities on the long uh, list. Right. Uh, I, uh, conveniently enough, as time is running out, uh, the Torin Torino games uh, were uh, very um, uh, uninteresting. Uh, the, perfect, <laughs> the perfect eulogy, here's a, no, not my quote, someone else, the perfect eulogy for the Torino Winter Olympics, nobody came, nobody watched, nobody starred, nobody cared. <laughs> so we go on to... Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Vancouver uh, Games, uh, criticism was, uh, I found very, very interesting, it in, included environmental issues, First Na Canadian First Nations, some of which were represented, the four major First Nations in the Squa Squamish Valley were represented, they, they really uh, sort of backed the Olympics bid. Uh, poor people, the homeless people in Vancouver were expecting to get a windfall, all this housing that was built for the Winter Olympics, no such thing. You've mentioned about real estate developers, the importance of real estate developers and, and uh, staging Winter Olympics is, 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 uh, is a, a very a, a, dirty, a dirty secret about Winter Olympics. Uh, there was not enough French used. Uh, I come from Quebec and the arguments that are coming out of Quebec was uh, French was, especially in the closing ceremonies, not used. The closing ceremony was very, very kitschy. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, you know one other thing because it you know, doesn't usually get mentioned uh, Olympics just like having wars in places like Bosnia 
uh, produce using uh, Susan uh, McClintock, I think, the, the feminist IR international relations scholar. It creates a train that's sort of a, of a, a second army of, of women, everything from nurses to prostitutes. Well, Winter Olympics games do the same thing. Uh, and so Vancouver, like other games before it, again, dirty secret about Winter Olympics, a lot of human trafficking uh, for the purpose of forced prostitution also accompanies uh, Olympic Games. And this is mentioned by a critic of the Vancouver Games of all places. What's different about Sochi? Um, uh, did Putin buy the vote? Well, maybe Salt Lake did as well. Um, Transparent nationalism, well, Canada and Vancouver emphasized um, rule the podium um, and uh, depriving athletes from, of, of other countries uh, of valuable training time. So the Georgian who was killed in the Luge event and the day before the Olympics started, the accusation was, yeah, he didn't get a chance to, uh, to, 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 take, uh, to take any practice runs on this Luge track uh, because the Canadians were uh, booked for, for that. So, so, you know, if, if, if you sort of find cheating at many Olympic Games, including in, in, in Canada. Authoritarian uh, governments, uh, yes. Um, uh, 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 cor corruption, overruns, waste, yes. Uh, listening to the figures you were presenting, I looked at Esquire Russia in an article in 2010, estimating the budget for cons constructing the 48-kilometer highway between Adler, which is the site of the opening and closing ceremonies, um, uh, and of the Olympic Village in Krasnaya Poryana, which is where the skiing is going to be taking place. That 48 kilometers, if you put down expensive sable fur coats along the entire 48 kilometers, uh, Esquire Russia said. It, you could pile them up three inches thick for 48 kilometers, you know, the, the four, four lanes, and, you, and, and it would cost less than the spending the Russians have uh, incurred. And, and now that you'd say it's up to 50 billion, it could be maybe 10, 10 inches worth of sable, yeah, sable furs. I'm worried about the Olympic uh, uh, venues, um, so Bodie Miller, uh, who I treat as a demigod, um, uh, uh, said disparagingly that uh, the run, the, wind, the, the downhill run at Sochi is not tiring at all, and it requires little need for tucking. So God forbid having Olympics at, on the course where you have little need for uh, tucking. The weather, I, you've already um, you know, got the idea. The official slogan of Sochi is hot, cool, yours. I see that as a threat, hot, cold, <laughs> yours. Um, human civil liber labor rights, they've been trampled on in many games, Olympic games, and maybe it's going to be worse uh, as a matter of degree in, Russia, in Sochi, uh, but it's happened uh, before. So um, it's not just the West that engages in, in, in Russophobia, it's the Kremlin itself. There's a website in, in the Kremlin uses to basically translate into Russian uh, anti-Russian articles. Uh, that appear in the West, and all a, an average Russian has to do is go to this website and find out that, yes, the world really is Russophobic. So the Kremlin itself is one of the primary exploiters of Russophobia and, 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 and makes very uh, good use of it. So I think this also is something that uh, is being used by the Putin administration uh, in the uh, Winter Olympics. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. We have about a half an hour left, and what I'm going to ask, because the audience is so big, that we group questions. And so we'll maybe take three questions at a time. Um, raise your hand if you've got something to ask, and please identify yourself, and do remember this is on the record. Yes? Hi. Uh, I have a question, just drawing on comments that each of you have made. Um, if indeed the Russian government is, in a sense, now held hostage to the Olympics, and drawing on the, the question of um, the best Olympic strategy being a kind of multicultural, creating a multicultural transnational space. I'm just wondering, um, and also presumably, thank you. Also, presumably, no, sorry. I don't think that's going to work. It's <laughs> not, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. The microphone's not for the audience. Yeah. Unfortunately, okay. it's just for the camera. It's for the, the recording. I had oh. no interest in using the microphone. No. Um, <laughs> And also, presumably, the Russian government has some financial interest in trying to recoup some of this $50 billion that's been spent. Um, I guess I, I'm just presenting the following question. 
what do you think would happen if all any all of you if uh, the majority of Olympic athletes in the games say wore a rainbow wristband? Okay, good question. What are the consequences of a Rainbow Olympics? A couple more people? Yes. And please identify yourself. Yes, sir. Um, can you draw any parallels? To what is your name and where are you from? These are kind of fields, uh, from outside. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you draw any parallels to the uh, Brazilian Olympics in terms of cost, uh, stadium, and potential for protest? Um, I haven't heard anything about that. Okay, so comparison to Brazil. Is there a third question to make it a group? Yes, in the back. Uh, Josh Okay. Um, frequently when the Olympics or the World Cup comes in, they have uh, kind of create their own small, internationally sovereign small state with the village and the stadiums and the arenas. And I'm curious to see what people on the panel think about how that might play out in Russia, uh, similar to some of the past um, nations that have been uh, kind of almost complex in terms of uh, humanitarian efforts and that sort of stuff. Okay. Anybody have any thoughts on any of those three questions? Let's just go down the line, starting with Andre. Uh, well, I would uh, say that uh, everything will depend on the scope of this uh, kind of rain Rainbow Olympics uh, campaign. Uh, but uh, anyway, we should not uh, underestimate the, uh, the 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 strength of the Kremlin's message. Saying, uh, sending to both domestic and foreign audiences. And this message was down to the fact that Russia is, uh, well, at least Putin's Russia, is seriously uh, ready and going to build it, its identity on distinguishing itself from the West. And uh, this is something which, uh, which is different from uh, the, the, the first two presidential terms of Putin and the Medvedev presidency. So uh, I don't think that the Kremlin will that easily give up on this issue. Most likely, uh, these uh, public manifestations of solidarity <coughs> will be uh, extremely negatively covered in uh, the Russian media. And uh, I suspect that they would be uh, used as a visual uh, kind of symbols of uh, uh, the West, which is culturally and socially very, very different uh, from Russia. So I think that uh, this campaign is important, but in the meantime, I, I also think that the Kremlin uh, is ready for kind of uh, dealing, uh, dealing with this challenge ideologically and uh, yeah, in terms of uh, PR, uh, <coughs> PR aspects. Other thoughts on the Rainbow Olympics question? Um, well, I, Sorry, I, what, what are Rainbow Olympics? I, I don't know. Yeah. I could guess, but I don't know if I'm sure about it. The idea that people would um, somehow wear rainbows or, or talk about, you know, have rainbow jewelry, rainbow symbols to symbolize um, LGBT issues um, when they are participating and in the game. Specifically games. athletes. Yeah, specifically, specifically athletes. athletes. Thank you. Well, I wanted to raise what I consider a very important question, which is the use by the Russian government of eminent domain, which doesn't cause the splash at all in the West in the way that the LGBT issue causes uh, huge controversy. Many, many people have been made homeless. This is an extraordinary gentrification of a city and the whole region. Uh, and there are a lot of very poor people that have been left out and have, have not been provided with any type of support to be able to move house. So uh, with, uh, with all the respect, and I'd love to see something like that, the idea of sort of uh, sort of uh, very visible signs of support and solidarity with the LGBT community. I wish there was some way to express solidarity with the people of the region that have been uh, dislocated. Uh, and also one other question regarding, uh, so, so I think Sochi, uh, like all Winter Olympics, but especially it was true of Lillehammer, as you can gather, uh, has to create a bubble uh, that is immune from any type of ethnic or racial or, or political or, or gender uh, or ethnic issues. A successful Winter Olympics is judged to be one uh, in which a bubble around the city, whether it's Calgary or Vancouver or Salt Lake or Lake Placid two times, uh, Innsbruck two times, uh, where you create a bubble and, uh, and, and keep everything out of the equation other than sports. Mm -hmm. I'd like to address the question about Brazil 
and the possibility of protest in, in Russia that along similarly in Brazil there's a lot of protest about corruption in the government, the co high cost of the stadiums, and, and that's brought a lot of people out on the streets. In Russia, there was a very interesting attempt to use the Olympics and the spending around them to mobilize the opposition against Putin, and that was in 2009 when Boris Nemtsov, who was actually born in Sochi, ran for mayor when they had an election there. And he, he ran a campaign very similar to the campaign that Alexei Navalny just ran in Moscow, where he didn't have it, they actually let him run because it was an Olympic city and everybody was paying attention, so they couldn't just toss him off the ballot like they usually do. But uh, and, but they didn't allow him on TV. So he, he ran a very interesting campaign where he was handing out flyers on buses and things like that and you know, going door to door. So a very grassroots oriented campaign. And he picked up on a lot of the issues. Like in, in Sochi, 2,000 people were basically uh, thrown out of their house and, and not given, uh, they claim, not uh, properly compensated for their property. Um, so that was a big issue, especially in the very early years after you know, 2008, 2009, when they were just starting the construction so for, for the site. Although, if you put that in co context of the Beijing games, of Beijing, they tossed out a million people. So uh, you know, it's a much bigger scale than it was in Russia. And, and you have that going on in the West, too, as, as your points make clear. Um, but that, you know, Nemtsov, even though he was picking up on all these issues and trying to mobilize the opposition around this stuff, he only ended up getting 13% of the vote. And so that was considered pretty good, considering the fact that, you know, they were using everything they could against him. He didn't have access to TV, and they, they shut down a lot of his meetings and things like that. So you don't seem to get that kind of protest in Russia based on these, these particular causes. And I think in Russia, there is sort of a national pride in the Olympics, which, uh, you know, it's not, it's not clear how the Brazilians are able to get around that, because everyone seems to be so proud of the Olympics. This was a big deal in Canada, too. There's a hilarious book about the Canadian Olympics called Five Ring Circus, yes, which, which lays out all the opposition to the, to the games there. But it was very difficult for the opposition in Canada to mobilize against the games because it, you know, it just has this aura. Everyone <laughs> likes to watch the Olympics, and it's you know, a national pride, and you know, why would you be opposed to that? You, even if all these things, dirty deeds are going on behind the scenes, you know, people are making a lot of money uh, at the expense of other people, uh, homeless and that kind of thing. So um, it doesn't seem to be a, a mobilizing, it doesn't seem to be a flashpoint in Russia. Uh, obviously there's other issues that are of concern in Russia. Corruption is a big deal, but the Olympics themselves don't seem to be a flashpoint. Well, uh, addressing the question about Rainbow Olympics, uh, which is probably the hottest uh, topic right now uh, uh, about the Olympics in 2014. Somehow it is uh, represented as black and white, uh, like Russia or Russians uh, are against the LGBT community, etc., which is not actually the case. So let's... Uh, uh, Imagine uh, such a scenario when uh, a lot of uh, athletes would uh, uh, turn this into such a uh, event when uh, there would be a lot of uh, support for LGBT uh, community. What could, would happen? First of all, it's not that in Russia uh, LGBT community is completely invisible or there is persecution of... Uh, uh, sexual minorities, you see a lot of them on TV. Like there are singers, uh, it, it's assumed that uh, there are a lot of them among celebra Russian celebrities. Uh, so uh, it, it is seen, LGBT uh, community is seen as celebrity uh, community. So if uh, the athletes would act like that, it would fall into that category, actually, into celebrity ca category. And it wouldn't affect that much the uh, general uh, perception uh, in Russia. From the other hand, uh, how Andres, uh, as Andre said, uh, Russians, uh, are the organizers of uh, Olympics will do everything to prevent that. And actually, they are doing a lot. For example, uh, two weeks ago, uh, International Olympic Committee asked the Russian Olympic Committee when they were signing this uh, uh, contract uh, document 
to include that uh, there will be no uh, nothing against uh, uh, sexual minorities LGBT uh, during uh, Sochi Olympics and the Russian delegation refused to put that into the document so after the negotiation they just put that there will be no uh, no, nothing against any kind of uh, minorities without mentioning LGBT. So in any official statements, in any, uh, not statements, but in any official uh, actions, uh, the Russian, uh, the Kremlin and the organizers, uh, they won't connect themselves with uh, 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 any support to LGBT. But in words, uh, especially uh, to uh, the Western audience, Putin and maybe other organizers, uh, maybe other officials, they will say openly that they don't have against uh, anything against the LGBT community. And actually, Putin recently announced that he uh, can meet with the leader of LGBT community in Russia. Uh, he won't meet, of course, but. Uh, the, the, the message to the West is that uh, there is nothing uh, going on there, don't worry. Uh, but for the uh, domestic audience, uh, they will completely distance themselves from any uh, connection. Be not because in Russia, uh, Russia is a very gender divided society, and uh, the LGBT community not as much as persecuted as ridiculized as uh, uh, so, so any politician uh, and for politicians in R Russia the image of strong manly is very important which you can see actually in many pictures uh, of Putin himself so any connection with the LGBT community would uh, damage uh, the manly reputation of uh, Russian uh, uh, politicians, so they in, for the mystic auditory uh, audience, they will distance themselves. I want to take the the privilege of chair to ask a question that nobody has really talked about yet, and ask you if any of you have any um, inside insights um, about um, threats of terrorism um, that might happen uh, surrounding the Sochi Olympics, um, about extra security measures. Um, anything on that uh, on that uh, particular issue, which I think has sort of fallen off the radar screen, but certainly uh, a year or two ago, people were very concerned about, given the location of Sochi very near the North Caucasus. Yeah. Well, security issue maybe is the biggest one uh, that uh, the organizers are concerned with. And uh, Bob Orton and I, we worked uh, on uh, the topic and we uh, could uh, see, we, we could line out this chronology of three st stages of uh, a security concept for the uh, Sochi Olympics that uh, Kremlin designed. And uh, the first stage was when uh, they uh, thought about uh, Sochi Olympics as military show. The, in the second stage was uh, when they uh, actually were concerned about the threats for the Olympics, not just from outside, uh, but f within the uh, Sochi and Krasnodar area as well. And the third stage w is that they issued this so-called spectator's passport, spectator's pass, Bilet uh, So anybody who would attend uh, Sochi Olympics would have to have this spectator pass. So for example, if you are an American, you buy a ticket, then you go to the embassy and uh, get visa. And of course, they, uh, you will be checked, your background will be checked from, uh, by diplomatic uh, sources. And after that, you apply for the spectator space, and FSB will check you. And uh, you can be rejected uh, b b for security issue on any of these three uh, stages. So uh, the, 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 the organizers uh, take this very, very seriously. And uh, actually, there is uh, 
threat to the Olympics. There were many attempts and many terrorist acts during the preparation uh, of the Olympics and uh, the Olympics will take place in the Caucasus, which is a very uh, terrorist active uh, uh, territory and about uh, 900 uh, people are killed uh, every year in this region. Uh, and uh, recently the leader of so-called uh, Caucasus Emirate, he announced that uh, they will perform terrorist acts in uh, Sochi and uh, it may happen actually. But the problem is that Russia is uh, in other in uh, economic and uh, corruption, political uh, regards, is no different from uh, the West where uh, terrorist acts, uh, acts take place as well. So even if terrorist act would take place there, uh, you can assume that the organizers can uh, interpret it the way that it's the same as in West and uh, there is nothing uh, specific uh, about it. I, I learned a couple of days ago that apparently uh, some of the people who are responsible for the Sochi Olympic security have gone to Israel um, to gain lessons about uh, counter-terrorist activity from the, the Israeli security forces. Does anybody else have any thoughts on yeah, this? Yeah. Uh, well, I would like to underline, uh, underline a couple of points concerning security. First of all, uh, in Sochi, uh, the exceptional security measures have been already uh, legalized and legitimized by a special decree of president, uh, who in fact introduced uh, something like uh, zones of enhanced uh, inspections, no-fly zones, uh, uh, very severe restrictions on uh, the movements of vehicles and uh, ships, etc., etc. So in the media, you can already have this matter for, of Olympic camp or something like that. Uh, th that's number one. And uh, this is, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of uh, continue this, uh, uh, this um, logic of, of, of Bob Orton who said that basically uh, the, the ruling regime has all chances to uh, to kind of to win public support because of uh, because of the Olympic game. I would say that uh, this is not exactly the case because within Sochi itself, people are extremely unhappy about uh, including the security measures uh, measures which are uh, which are taken. And uh, if you take a look at local uh, uh, bloggers and uh, what they discuss. Uh, this is an extremely a, a set of extremely critical attitudes to the whole uh, to the whole project and security. I mean, it, it, those exceptional security measures are a part of this uh, of this uh, of this skepticism or this uh, uh, this negative attitudes. Point number two: the irony is that Abkhazia was officially recognized as a security threat for for Sochi Olympics. That's really unfortunate, and this is really ir ironic. It was a statement of FSB saying that yes, we have identified a number of uh, a number of terrorists who are planning to penetrate into into, into the, the Sochi area using Abkhazian territory. Well, here we are. That's that's really a problem. Next, I think it's also important to take into account that the reliance on uh, the, the the support and loyalty, political loyalty of local elites in all North Caucasian uh, uh, territories is key for uh, providing security. It was Ramzan Kadyrov who said that uh, I would personally destroy, uh, well, I'm not going to give names, but someone who, uh, who threatened uh, directly uh, the, 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 the security and safety of Sochi Olympics. And we know that sometimes a Kremlin did use uh, the, 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 the technical resources of uh, uh, the, the ruling elite in Chechnya for uh, uh, for the benefits of, of its uh, security. Uh, what is also interesting that is that using the experience of uh, Kazani capital of Tatarstan in which uh, another mega event, the Universiade, uh, uh, took place, well, it, uh, to me it's a little bit, uh, a little bit puzzling uh, the way how authorities deal with, uh, with the terrorist threats because what I have seen in the media is that 
the organizers of uh, the, 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 the Kazan uh, Universidad informally have reached, uh, reached an agreement with uh, the, the, the terrorist organizations uh, kind of trying to uh, or making them discontinue their, uh, their operations during the Universidad. That's how things uh, were kind of covered by the media. I know whether it's uh, true or not. But Again, this is a problem of, uh, of, of this in informal in dealings or informal uh, agreements. And finally, I would also uh, draw your attention to the fact that uh, the security of, of the Sochi Olympics will be partly uh, provided by uh, Cossacks, Cossack mili uh, paramilitary units. This is something really frustrating. Can you imagine Cossacks? Uh, Explain what Cossacks are, because not everybody in the audience might know. Well, they are, historically speaking, uh, well, the, 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 well, people say that this is a social group of paramilitary uh, people who were settled historically to, to protect Russian borders and to protect Russian security from, from basically from external uh, threats. Uh, but they are really, uh, they have a very, uh, I would say, very controversial reputation in, uh, in, in the Krasnodar Krai because they, have wanted to have, they, they want to have their voice and, and their role in uh, uh, security uh, provision and uh, uh, they, 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 they want to have their political influence and they want to uh, kind of uh, raise their, uh, their political uh, profile using uh, Sochi as one of one of those possibilities. I personally uh, just uh, uh, cannot imagine how uh, Cossacks could, would expect uh, would, would inspect I you know foreign uh, tourists or uh, ask them for I you know to, 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 to comply with, uh, with the certain regulations and and Cossacks are those who uh, want uh, the LGBT people be physically beaten by the way in uh, in especially in southern uh, parts of, of Russia which makes the whole idea of uh, kind of uh, 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 shifting so, some, uh, some, uh, some functions on uh, security provision to Cossacks a little bit ironic for the whole, for, for this uh, presumed success of the whole Olympic project. I'm, I'm glad that Andre brought up the issue of informal politics in a couple of different ways, both in looking at the, the Cossacks as being a potential paramilitary security force that don't have to follow the rules that the police follow, so they're not really reporting to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the idea of the, the, the um, kinds of pacts that can be reached between the governing officials and the people who are supposedly the terrorists trying to unseat them, um, because there have been accusations of that happening in Chechnya, too, with Ramzan Kadyrov um, going back a, you know, a decade in, in terms of... Uh, being able to turn up or turn down the heat um, for political purposes. We probably have time for one more question, if anybody has a question. Yes, sir. Hi. I go to the meetings of the protesters who are trying to bring about a boycott, basically. Um, and I wanted to know, what would you advise they do? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends whom you mean. Exactly. What, what kind of uh, protesters? Well, these are gay people that are concerned about gay people in Russia. Well, I think I, I, I had already answered to right. this question in my uh, at the very end of my of my presentation. Uh, I, w I mean, conceptually, it would be very nice if the whole uh, uh, the whole script of the Sochi Olympics would uh, kind of represent more kind of universal human rights values rather than parochial nationalistic uh, kind of type of uh, expensive show staged by uh, by the regime so that would be uh, that would be the best way to uh, to deliver certain me messages to uh, to the Russian population and uh, to kind of open up uh, the whole project for uh, uh, for being a part of the cosmopolitan uh, uh, type of uh, mega events, uh, uh, in, at least in Russia. And because, uh, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. Let me just add that on November 6th, we're having an entire event on this okay. on this issue. Um, and one of the, the really important issues that we haven't really talked about that much in terms of the Russian population is that um, homophobia is really big in Russia. And I don't think there are many people who believe that you're going to get the Russian population riled up uh, against any of the organizers of the Olympics by making it an issue because, as some of the, the people on the panel have said, 
it can so easily be used as something that's a political tool that just says, oh, the West is out to get us and they have corrupt values and we are the ones who, you know, under the banner of the Russian Orthodox Church are carrying out the, the correct way of being. Um, and so there, there's some um, uh, uh, calls that, that any attempts to put pressure on anybody uh, uh, for the, the Sochi Olympics should be going to the Western companies that are supporting it rather than trying to do anything in Russia that's just going to backfire. And, and one interesting idea is that the Visa Corporation is a major sponsor of the Olympics and the Visa Corporation has also put itself forward as being a corporation that is very gay friendly. Um, and so telling the Visa Corporation that there's a disconnect there may be a way of shining the spotlight on a corporation that has worked in some other places in the world. So I'll that's, just throw that out there. That's, that's a good point because I think you can see that the pressure on the West, like and also on the IOC is having an effect because they just decided where the 2020 games are going to be and they picked Japan over Istanbul and, and Turkey and I think they really wanted to do it in Turkey because that would have been the first games in a Muslim country and you know Turkey has sort of been a success story up until the protests that happened this summer so I think they were, they were worried about the protests and how they would get mixed up in this kind of crackdown again after being in China and Russia and you know more, more crackdowns on, on civil society so they went with Japan which was a much safer bet you know a more established democracy in a sense than Turkey is. So this pressure does seem to have an impact on the Western based organization. Any final thoughts from anybody on the panel? Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, uh, the uh, Olympics will take place. Uh, th that's like 99%. That's uh, the most uh, important conclusion from for everything, uh, all the talks over uh, the Olympics and uh, uh, the most important thing, I think, uh, is to uh, see through this Olympics how Russia functions. Uh, because this Olympics, in many ways, in political economy, in uh, uh, politics, in uh, uh, human rights, it, this Olympics will highlight the Ru how, how is Russia today. It's n so you will not just hear some headlines about what Putin said, uh, how uh, they act towards Syria, or particularly about some particular, some que specific question, but you will, this Olympics will show today's Russia, and that's the most important message of the Olympics, uh, how I see it. I see Ray shaking his head. Do you want to have a... Well, it's as if, uh, <laughs> it's as if the other countries that uh, hosted Olympics uh, weren't doing, doing precisely the same thing. It, it's, it's, as Andre is the specialist on this, but it's the representation of a particular nation. Uh, there's no probably greater example. Exhibit A in my book is uh, Barcelona hosting the uh, Summer Olympics, I think it was around 1980, to present Catalan nationalism. You know, that was remarkable. That is as extraordinary. No one has done it as good as that. I don't think the Russians are going to be able to muster that type of support, you know, and, and image making in the way that uh, Barcelona and Catalonia did it in 1980. Um, well, just one final thought, which okay. is that um, <laughs> the, uh, in the Western size, the Olympics can be seen sort of as an exception. It's a big mega project. It's a, a, a situation where business interests can push out civil society to a much much more effectively than they can in, in the general course of events. And so I think that, but obviously, you know, it happens all the time in the West, but I think that's why it's attractive to Putin and China and those, those kind of countries, because they can use sort of a Western model. It's a very effective Western model of allowing a small group of elites do whatever they want to the exclusion of the broader social interest. So I think, that, you know, it's true that you, you get the same thing going on in Russia that you have in the West, but I think that's why it's attractive to the Russian leadership. All right. Well, m maybe one, 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 one comment. Um, the, 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 the attention to and, and studies on uh, the Olympic project and other mega uh, events in Russia are important uh, because they, they help us uh, unveil all the controversies of uh, Putin's uh, political project and, and, and especially his understanding of the issues of uh, sovereignty. Of course, I understand that all others do something like that. But you know the devil is in, in, in details. If some of uh, one of you have uh, read the, uh, the most recent uh, uh, law signed by Putin on the organization in uh, Russia of the World FIFA, Football or Soccer Cup in the year 2018, 
Well, you will find there many, many quite interesting, uh, interesting uh, clauses or in, in, in interesting details, I would say. For example, uh, all FIFA contractors will not pay taxes in the Russian budget. But that all is imposed by FIFA, so... Exactly, <laughs> that's imposed by FIFA. But this also is very much telling on the controversies of the Putin sovereign uh, project, of, of, of Putin's understanding of sovereignty. So as soon as it comes to huge mega projects, FIFA can be the most important kind of reference point for, for many, many economic transactions. And that's also a kind of a political, uh, one of political uh, effects of hosting uh, a number of mega projects in Russia. So Sochi is unique, but it's the same as everybody else. <laughs> exactly. And we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And join me in the <laughs>